we can go and look at the output that we got. So here, the black genes are the ones that were originally in the list. The links are colored based on what the data source is that supports them. So some links are supported by both physical interactions. So these two genes have been shown to physically interact in all these different studies. And it's also supported by co-expression. So these two genes are co-expressed in this one study. You can tell that this list line is thicker than this because there's more evidence for physical interaction than co-expression. Over here, we see, and we, and we see the relative weights that have been assigned to the different data sources. So co-expression gets eight, about 80% of the weight, and physical interactions get about 20% of the weight. We can look down, we can look at the weights in uh, individual co-expression studies, and just by hovering over top of this, I, I see the, uh, the links from that study. Don't worry about following along necessarily with this because we have this, we're going to have a lab about this tool and we have a, um, a, uh, an assignment that you can use to go through this tool. But just to illustrate the point about the weighting is, is these are the weights that have been assigned based on how well each network connects together the, gene, uh, the genes that are originally in the list, which are the black boxes. Now you can go through and you can look for enriched functions by taking this, and so I guess what happened was this list is a list of genes that are involved in DNA recombination. And so you can see the ones that are red with the dashes through them, those are the ones that are in DNA recombination that were orig also originally on the list. The smaller nodes are, are nodes that gene mania has added, and these are other ones that are also involved in the process of DNA recombination. Okay. All right, this is probably a bit more of a involved in double stand break, strand break repair, and then we just make a little function link in there. Okay. So that's to show you where the weights come from. So here I consider a lot of other different types of, this is the, this is the gene list from the previous slide, and then these are the weights that are assigned to all the various different sources of information on this gene list. Okay, and then here are the, 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 either the black nodes or the nodes that are colored with the, the bars through them are ones in the original list, and everything else are recommended genes or related genes that Gene Mania has found. Okay. Right, so I showed you opening up the advanced options panel to select the networks. Sorry, this is still an answer to your question. So to select the networks in the first place. So if you don't select a network, it gets assigned to zero weight. Once you select the network, then Gene Mania assigns a weight to them, either based on your gene list or based on some other measure of the relevance of that data source. And the other measure is how well that uh, network reproduces uh, known annotations for genes. Right? So if you take all the pathway databases, you take the Go annotation databases, and then you try assigning weights to networks so that you do a good job at reproducing those, those Go annotations, you can get, that's how the, the weighting gets done, for example, for single genes. Okay, and then the last way, so this, I've told you about two weighting schemes, and you can actually select from another, uh, a number of other weighting schemes if you just go down here to the network weighting, and I'll explain that later in, in the presentation. Okay. So you saw me go through this. I clicked open this thing to get to the advanced options. This is the network panel. I clicked on check boxes to select all or some of the networks, and the, this, this fraction here indicates what proportion networks are there. And if you click through on this, as you saw, you get down to the individual networks. So here, I, you know, here if you click through on co-localization, there's one co-localization network in yeast that we have, and it's this, right, this is famous study that does protein localization based on GFP tagged uh, proteins in budding yeast. And you can click it on or off to decide whether to include that data or not. Okay, and so as I said, you can come up with a single weighting or a single network which combines together all the data sources in a fixed way. Um, and then you could do that either by just adding them together. So the strength of linking between two nodes is actually just the strength of the links in, in all the data sources where, those, uh, where a link has been measured between those nodes. That's a surprisingly effective thing to do. But you can also assign them a weight, as I said before, based on how well that data source matches the co-annotation patterns that you see in gene ontology. And that's what most people do, and that's what GeneMania does. Okay. And then, as I said before, if your list is long enough, you can weight genes, uh, you can weight networks based on how well they reproduce that list. 
and that's that's what I'm calling the context dependent network. Okay, and so basically by doing this, asking this question, how well does the network waiting, uh, how well does the network reproduce the gene lists? You're basically setting weights based on two rules. Is the network relevant for this function? Right? Meaning, like, are the genes in the query list most often connected to one another than to other genes? Also, you're asking the question, is this network redundant? Meaning that, are there two networks that essentially have the same set of connections? If there are two networks that have the same set of connections, you shouldn't be assigning them collectively more weight than that uh, a single version of the network would get. Right? So if we had two networks that were exactly the same, the sum of the weights that they get assigned should be equal to the weight that that single network will get just by itself. Right? And so that's, so you want to make sure that you're not overweighting redundant networks. And the reason this is important is that it's really easy to generate networks from co-expression studies. Co-expression studies are cheap. There's thousands and thousands of them in databases. And so if you don't do, and often they provide redundant information. So often, if you do uh, make a co-expression network, what you find is that genes that are involved in growth or cell division tend to get um, linked together very highly. And that's because one of the first things that happens when you start perturbing cells is you change how quickly they're growing. Right? And so when you look for differential expression, or you're looking for cell or, or genes that are responding in the same way to the perturbations, you're looking at genes that are involved in the same growth functions. That's going to be your strongest signal. So you want to, you know, there's also other signals in co-expression networks, but you want to make sure that you don't spend all your time reproducing this growth signal over and over and over again. So you have to remove this redundancy between the networks. Okay. Okay, and so in gene mania what we do is, is we automatically select which of these weighting schemes you should use. If your gene list is short, we don't know what question you're asking. Like if you give me one gene, you could be asking a lot of different questions. And so we don't know how to weight the network. So just by default, we use the set of fixed weights that comes from how good that network is at reproducing known function. If you give us a longer list, then we use what I, the, the query dependent scheme that I told you about. Now that being said, um, we give you multiple options. We also allow you to equally weight each of the data sources. If you don't believe our algorithms for weighting data sources, you can just assign every data source that you selected an equal weight. So it contributes equally to making these inferences. Okay, and then also, if you want us to assign, uh, if you have, if you want to define your question a little bit more, you can say, well, am I asking about the biological process of the single gene, the molecular function of the single gene, or the cellular component, like where it sits in the cell? And then you can choose from one of these three weighting schemes um, basically, you know, I told you we weight networks based on how well they reproduce uh, co-annotation patterns in gene ontology. Well, there's three different hierarchies of gene ontology, the biological process, the molecular function, the cellular component, uh, compartment. So you can just, you can only look at co-annotation in one of these hierarchies. Okay. All right. Um, and I've told you about all this so far. Okay, so then... I've told you about networks. I've, I've, I've told you about the idea of combining networks together to, um, uh, to ask questions. I've told you about uh, how you might weight the contributions for different, from different networks, either automatically or based on your query list. So now once you have the network, let's say this is the network that we have, how do we find what are the guilty associates of a gene? What do we, how do we find which genes are most heavily associated with the query list that we put in? Okay, so let's say that this is our network. Uh, so here we have a network. And it's a pretty small network. It's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 genes in it. Um, four of these genes are in the query list. And seven of these genes aren't. And then the question is, what genes are most associated with the query list in this network? Okay, well, there's two main ways of coming up with this, uh, what are, genes are most associated with it. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to use this, uh, these main algorithms to assign a score to every gene based on how associated they are with the query list. Okay, so red means a high score, white means a low score. Okay, the first method is called direct interaction. 
Basically, you score a gene by looking at its neighbors in the network and saying how many of them are in the query list and how strong are my links to that. So for instance, one way, you know, then there's different ways of combining this type of information together, but an easy way to think about it is you could say, well, let's take the sum of the weight of, all, or of the links to a node. So in, case, in this case, this node here. So it's got three links, right? How many of those links lead to genes in the query list, two of the three. And maybe you include the, the weight. So if, if this is a stronger, you know, if these weights uh, links are stronger than this one, then maybe your score becomes more than two out of three, and maybe it becomes like three out of four, just because you sum the weight to the, to the things in the query list. There's a variety of different methods that all use the same strategy of just looking at your neighbors and seeing how many of them are on the query list. They vary by whether they count, whether they include the weights, how they combine the weights together, do they multiply the weights together, or do they sum them. But basically, they're all testing direct interaction within a neighborhood. So the point I want to make about this is these types of algorithms are great. Um, but they can only assign scores to genes that are directly interaction, in, in, interacting with the query list. But you can see here that there's five other genes that it, it's unable to distinguish between here, right? Um, they all get the same score because they don't directly interact with any genes in the query list. But in this case, you might think that this gene should get a slightly high, higher score than this gene here, right? Because this gene, even though it's not directly connected to anything in the query list, there's a lot of indirect interactions with the query list, right? It interact, indirectly interacts with, you know, with three other genes. And, it, and it's extremely important to include these in, uh, indirect interactions because the, the data sources that you're looking at often they have a lot of false negatives. They're incomplete. And uh, more so, actually, sometimes they have false positives. So they say two pairs of genes interact when they don't, right? And it's important to avoid it, to detect these false positive interactions. And one way of detecting these false positive interactions is whether or not they're associated, they're supported by a lot of indirect interactions, right? If two genes actually interact, they actually have a lot of friends in common. They have a lot of indirect interactions between them. This is a, a general property that people have discovered of these biological networks, that they have this what's called um, a high clustering coefficient. They tend to turn occur in groups of genes that have high inter interactivity among them. And so another way of computing the guilty associates is what's called label propagation. And what you do in label propagation is you allow this, this score to propagate through the network along links, getting a little bit weaker the further and further away you get from the, from the initial query list. Right? So in this case, for example, this gene here, one way of computing its score is to compute the score of these genes, right? And then this score is derived from the score of its neighbors. And then this score is derived from the score of, uh, uh, is derived from its neighbor here. And people have um, associated the types of things that happen when you use these algorithms as heat propagation. So if you can imagine that these are sources of heat, right? And then you have a little bit of loss heat loss at each one of these nodes, and then these are continuously giving out heat. This is the amount of heat that might arrive at each one of these nodes, but notice no heat ever arrives to this part of the network because there's no connections at all that can transmit the heat. Right? And so this part of the network that does, has no connection at all to the component that contains the query genes, the score gets to be zero, allowing you to distinguish none of these two genes from these genes here. And so. Here is a little bit more information about each of these uh, scoring algorithms. Um, an example al algorithm in, within the score space of direct interaction methods is called naive Bayes. And then an example algorithm in label propagation, obviously, is gene mania. And there's a lot of other algorithms in this space, like hotnet is included within this space. There's something called label prop. But in general, they, they have the same properties in that they indirectly propagate direct neighbor score so that the indirect links to the, to the query list can have some influence on scores. So here's another label propagation example that makes use of the fact that, that shows, I think, a bit more clearly that pairs of genes with a lot of strong interactions or groups of genes with a lot of strong interactions together end up getting high scores. So here, scores uh, is indicated by the, um, 
the size of the node. So this is what you start from. These four genes are on the query list. And so the scores of the nodes within this cluster that's highly connected to one another, they all reinforce each other when you do the label propagation. But the fact that this, this, uh, this gene here, which has, you know, is, is, you know, has a lot of functions, the pleiotro pleiotropic, is connected to uh, other clusters of genes, that doesn't make for a lot of propagation of label to these other clusters. Right? So, so even though you, you, a direct interaction approach would give high scores to these genes because they're connected to something with, which has this function, when you do label propagation, it kind of cleans that up a little bit. OK, so the three parts of Gene Mania and other uh, gene recommender systems is you have a large automatically collect, uh, uh, updated collection of interaction networks. We go through the literature, and we go through the internet, and we pull down uh, periodically all the interaction networks we can get our hands on. Uh, our role is to include all the data that's readily available uh, when you're doing your functional predictions. Um, other methods like string do the same thing. They're constantly updating their interaction networks. You can think of us as, as, a, as a network data source, but, because, but we compile for uh, networks that other people have make of it made available. Also, there's a query algorithm that finds genes and networks that are functionally associated to your query list. So you find genes by finding the ones that are highly interacting with your query list. You find networks by just looking at the network weights after you do the gene mania query. Right? Say you have a list of genes and you don't know, you want to know more about that list of genes. You can find other genes that are on the list, but you can also find out how they're most connected to one another. Like, is this list of genes actually co-expressed? And if this list of genes is co-expressed with one another, you can look up the co-expression and find out, well, which study gets the most weight, saying what, under what conditions is this list of genes co-expressed with one another. And then we have this network browser that we make available to you. Then, and uh, I don't know, you'll see it more so um, uh, when you do the assignment, but there's a lot of link outs. So there's links to allow you to link through and find out more information about the studies that the networks came from or more information about the genes by looking at the genes in the network database. So what data do we collect? Well, we compile data from the gene expression omnibus. We pull in all the co-expression data that satisfies um, some basic controls that we use to make sure that that the data is well formed. We, uh, we pull in genetic interactions from a database called BioGrid. We, we pr pull in physical interactions from uh, a database called IREF Index. And what IREF Index is, is it sucks physical interactions up from all the various different databases that compile physical interactions, like Mint, uh, Intact. These are annotation efforts where people go through the literature and they, they put a physical interaction with it in their database if it's supported by some paper they've read. They've read. Okay. So there are a number of parallel efforts that are somewhat overlapping but mostly independent. And what ILF index does is it groups all these, in, uh, uh, these networks together. These, these networks are available separately on what's something called a psychic server, but I won't go into that exactly. The other source that we use for finding functional interactions is we get what are called interologs. So does anybody know what an interlog is? OK. So if two, uh, interlog basically uh, uh, encapsulates this idea of two genes interact in mouse, they pro their orthologs probably interact in human. Right? So it's, in it's interaction by orthology. That's what, that's what interlog stands for. So if you have an interaction network, and you're able to identify orthologs in a different species, then interologs say, well, those orthologs probably interact as well. It's not a perfect source of information. It can be a weak source of information. But especially for organisms where there's very little interaction data, it might be incredibly useful. And under some circumstances, it's actually a great source of information. If you find that two genes uh, interact in human, and then you also find that those two genes interact in yeast, that's probably an interaction that you can rely on. And so, and the last uh, major data source that we get, uh, well, there's two other data sources I want to talk about. One is uh, uh, protein domains. So people know what protein domains are, more or less. So protein domains are like, uh, there's a database that looks for sequences, uh, subsequences within protein sequences. There's a P database that's called PFAM, or sometimes it's now called Interpro, then that are represent conserved domains, like, you know, 
a zinc finger domain is a type of a domain, or an SH2 domain is a type of domain. So these are proteins, parts of the protein that fold independently into structures that are conserved throughout various organisms. So you can scan through a protein sequence and infer where these protein domains might occur on a gene. And that tells you a lot about this biochemical function. So one way to generate a network is ask whether or not a given gene has the same set of protein domains as something else that we know has a given biochemical function. So that's another source of data that we use. We also have, most recently, we've included data which we call attributes. And this is data that's been compiled by Gary Bader's lab, including a lot of data that came from the MSIG database, which is hosted at the Broad, um, that, uh, that assigns annotations to genes. So what's an annotation? Well, it could be like, it's the gene sets that we've talked about previously. Are they all on the same chromosome? Do they all have the uh, same transcription factor binding site in their promoter? Do they all have this type of domain? Are they all associated with this disease? Do they all, uh, are they an annotated target of a drug? Are they predicted target of a microarray? Right? And so we pull in as many of those annotations that we can. We don't turn this on by default because, because within the annotations are in included gene sets. So if you're asking the question, what does my gene do? you might be getting circular information about what your gene does because we're using the fact that your gene is annotated in a certain way to find more genes like that that have the same annotation. But you can turn that on by, um, by opening the advanced options panel and just clicking that on. It gives you a lot of information about uh, your gene list. Um, we do our best to, rep, uh, to identify every gene ID that we can. Okay. Um, now we're restricted in one way. Uh, as Gary said in the first talk that you, that you got, sometimes genes have a, the exact same name, right? And he gave you one example where two genes, the, the gene symbol, it differed between two genes, it differed by capitalization, which is like crazy, right? I mean, you don't, you're not really necessarily even going to remember what the capitalization is. And so, and then genes sometimes are associated, so there's... So what, gene, you know, what Gary showed you on that, that list with all the kind of weird looking symbols on it, he showed you gene identifiers. Those are like your social insurance number, right? Um, you can also have gene symbols. That's a sort of the somewhat human readable name of the gene. And then there's also things that we are called gene synonyms. That's like when someone says, okay, well, this gene's name is smog, or this gene's, you know, if you, you know, if you're like a fly biologist, you know, this gene's name is aubergine. So the genes have these like longer names. We do our best to recognize everything that we can based on what annotation is available for that gene ensemble, but we remove any genes from consideration that have redundant names. So we don't, we don't recognize identifiers that map to more than one gene. Okay. And yeah, we pull our gene annotations in from gene uh, geontology. Okay, and we get some organism-specific databases. You just have to click around for the organisms to see what's available. Okay. So right now, um, we cover eight organisms. So these are the, one, these are the organisms that have enough throughput data, uh, high throughput data that it's, uh, we think it's useful to have like a, a, a large publicly available system uh, to cover them. And that's human, mouse, rat, zebrafish, uh, C. elegans, Drosophila, uh, Arabidopsis, yeast, and E. coli. These are the, like, the eight mo major model organisms in terms of the amount of data that's available for them. If you're working on a model organism that's, uh, that's not one of these eight, you have, uh, you have a variety of things you can do. One of the things you can do is you can try to find the orthologs for the genes that you're interested in that, in the closest model organism. Um, we also uh, make it possible to make a gene mania instance for your own model organism. You just have to provide a couple things. And you're not going to be able to ac access it through the website, but you can access it through the Cytoscape plugin which has all the functionality of the website. Okay. Right now we have about, well, we have more than 2,000 networks. I would say about 1,500 of them are co-expression networks. Uh, and then of course we make this web network browser available, but you can also browse through Cytoscape because we have a plugin which has the identical data and functionality of JMini. Okay. The other useful thing about the plugin is on the website, we only make our most recent data release available. So like I said, periodically we update the, our network databases by the sucking in all the data that's available. And we also have to update our gene annotations because these change all the time. 
uh, and you wouldn't believe how much they change. You think that things are stable, you think that this is the name of the gene, it's not because it changes all the time in the, in the annotation databases. So sometimes we're a little bit behind in the annotation, we don't recognize a given gene name, but if you take your gene and you go and you look it up in ontogene, you find synonyms for the gene, sometimes we'll be able to recognize the synonyms or the other gene identifier that is associated with it. So, but in the Cytoscape plugin, we can only, in, in the website, we can only make the most recent data available. In the Cytoscape plugin, you can pull in all the older data releases. So the reason we do that is, is, is for reproducibility. If you run a gene mania analysis on a previous data set and somebody wants to reproduce that gene mania analysis, well, they can't do it through our website, but they can do it on the Cytoscape plugin by pulling in the old data. Um, and then, you know, as I said, you can add new organisms. So if you're able to construct uh, a bunch of data sources for a given organism, you can access and get access to that through the Cytoscape plugin. It's not easy, uh, but we have, we, we have the ability to do that, and we make the tools available to, to let you do that. Um, and you can integrate gene mania networks with other Cytoscape analyses. And then the other thing is, is, is on our website, we have a restriction in the length of the query list. We don't take query lists longer than, I think, 100 or 200 genes. And the reason for that is not that we can't do the analysis, but that, like, network browser where I was moving stuff around, that thing contains a lot of information. And so when you, when Gene Mania finishes the analysis, it constructs that thing for you, and then it sends it through the web to you. And that can take a long time. The other thing is, is that thing is, is right now it's encoded in uh, uh, something called Flash, which is um, a pretty slow uh, programming language. So once you get more than about 100 genes in that network browser, things slow down uh, a lot. And so we don't want people to get very bad performance on the website, but, so we don't let you use long query lists, but you can use long query lists in the Cytoscape plugin. And hopefully within the next few months, uh, we already have a working demo of this, We've replaced the network browser, which is made out of Flash, with a new type, uh, uh, with a new language, which is like J uh, JavaScript and, and HTML5 compliant, which when things should get a whole lot faster, indeed they look like they will, so we'll remove that um, barrier. But the other thing is, is right now Gmania doesn't run on iPads because Steve Jobs doesn't like Flash or didn't like Flash. So, so you can't run Gmania on iPads, you can't run Gmania on your phone. Uh, when, we, when we release the new version that uses the new type of network, you should be able to, we, you can run it on an iPad, you can run it on a phone. Okay, um, one last thing that, that, we, uh, that we include is something called Query Runner. And so what's Query Runner? So, because Gmania takes all the network data that's available in the world, that, that's easily accessible, we can say something about how much the, the sort of all the high throughput data that's been generated to date, how good that is at reproducing what's already known about gene function, discovered through different methods, right? Which is kind of cool in itself, right? That's, that's like saying, say I didn't know that much about gene function, I wanted to reproduce gene function, could I do it just using all the data, uh, all the high throughput data? But it does allow you to also do it another type of analysis and that's like, the analysis is like, okay, I've generated this big genetic interaction network. How much have I added to the global knowledge of gene function that's available in these networks? Right? Like, how much better am I able to reconstruct the gene ontology categories now that I include this new network compared to all the networks that were available before? Right? And so we wanted to do this analysis uh, for this, this paper that we participated in about five years ago with this large genetic interaction network, and then ask the question, well, of all the genetic interaction networks were available, what's the, what's the gain that we get from adding this network compared to all the other various genetic interaction networks to all the other, uh, network, uh, all the other data that was currently available? So we can assess the added predictive value of new data. Okay, so the major kind of complementary uh, uh, um, other um, gene recommender system is something called String, and String's actually been around a lot longer than Gmania. So Gmania's been around since about 2010. Uh, String's been around since about 2000. Um, and String 
has much of the functionality that G-mania does. They add some functionality that we don't have, and they don't have some things that we, that we do have. Um, what's different about string, there's two major advantages to string. One is, is that they have a much larger organismal coverage. So they cover hundreds of organisms. I mean, most of this coverage is due to, like, they, they come up with interologs, but they, they, you can ask questions about sort of any organism that's in ensemble through string. The data coverage might be pretty small for some of the organisms, but that, those organisms are there. The other major difference with string is they're focused on proteins, not genes. Uh, what that means is, is they collect different types of information. Right? So it doesn't make sense to talk about genetic interactions among proteins necessarily. Right. So, and for them, what they do that's also different from what we do is they put a lot more effort into curating networks. So they actually have like eight network types that are, that are much more curated, whereas we just pull it all in and we hope we get our algorithms to sort out what network data is relevant, what network data isn't relevant. And so, or we let you decide through yourself by like turning networks on and off and seeing whether or not you believe what the answers are. Okay, and, and they have this nice uh, interface which is actually based off uh, the web browser that we developed for GeneMania. Uh, and then you can click through here, and you, I don't know if you can see this, but proteins that have structures associated with them, you can click on the nodes and get those structures back, which is, I think is super cool. Okay, and then these are the predicted functional partners. Um, they use a direct interaction scheme to find the, the most likely partners, which means that they, they get different answers than we do, also because they use different data. But then also they have like a lot of other really interesting analysis that you can do. They can look for gene fusion and occurrence events. They can look at gene neighborhood. Um, you can ask me questions about this, but uh, a lot of these analysis and a lot of this sort of the string coverage comes from prokaryotes. So in prokaryotes, there's, uh, there's a lot of other sources of data about gene function that aren't as useful in eukaryotes. And those are things like, um, you know, is the, are, are these two genes in the same operon, right? So obviously if they're this, in the same operon, they're going to be co-expressed and they're probably involved in the same function. Do these two genes, are they separate in some organisms and fused in the others, right? If they're separate in some organisms and fused in the other, then probably the ones that are separate in, there's actually a protein per interaction between them and there's some, this fusion gives evidence for a shared function of these genes. And the other thing that's, uh, that's incredibly useful in prokaryotes is, is do these sets of genes, do they co-occur in the same sets of prokaryotes, right? If you have a tail, or whatever that thing is called, <laughs> all the genes that are going uh, to be involved in making that thing run, they're going to be in the same set of prokaryotes, right? So this type of information, the neighborhood information, tells you about whether or not they're on the same operon, whether they fuse, or whether they co-occur. It, this, is, this is useful for defining gene function in prokaryotes, much less so for eukaryotes. And so spring, string gives you access to all that type of information. Okay. So then I've, 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 given the, I've written out the comparison here, but we've already gone through this. Okay. So have we done the learning objectives? Uh, yes, I hope. We've talked about function interaction networks, built guilt by association, gene recommender systems. I've talked extensively about different ways of weighting uh, networks or uh, types of data. I've talked to you about two different net, uh, algorithms for predicting gene function once you're given a network. One is just to look at the neighbors of the genes, and one is to propagate information about function through the network. Uh, you should be able to use a gene recommender system now to answer two types of questions. If you can't now, you certainly will be in the next, uh, once uh, the next two hours are done. And, um, we're going to go in more of this in the next, but you should be able to select the appropriate uh, network weighting scheme to answer your questions. Okay, uh, so we're on a coffee break, but do we have any questions before we, we start our break?